For Criminal Media's Policy, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today is author Tony Park, here to talk about his co-authored book titled Rhino Hall. Hi, Mr. Park. Hi, Tabi. Thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure. So can you talk to us more about the work involved in putting this book together and how you and retired Major General Johan Joster came to start working on the book? Yeah, I, um, most of the writing I've done in the past has been fiction. Um, I've written 19 novels with the 20th coming out, touching on similar subjects to Rhino War. So this was a little bit different because now this is a non-fiction book about the same subject, about the, the plight of the rhinos in South Africa in particular. General Euston, I have a mutual friend. I didn't realise this, but a, a guy, a South African guy living in Australia, where I'm also from, and uh, he got in touch with me and said, there's someone who wants to talk to you. And when I found it was uh, retired General Johan Eusta, I was amazed. I, I had to pick my jaw up off the floor. And, and to be honest, I had a bit of a fanboy moment because I had never met him or spoken to him. But I remember very well his appointment back at the end of 2012 when he was brought in, quite controversially at the time, to take over the, the fight to protect the rhino, particularly in the, in the Kruger Park, and to change the way the Ranger Corps uh, did business. And I remember thinking at the time, I would love to meet this guy. You know, I would love to just pick his brains, get to know him. But I thought, he's going to be too busy to talk to a mm. fiction author like me. So I was thrilled when our mutual friend put us in touch. And in fact, the general was actually not even thinking that he necessarily wanted to write a book. He was actually reaching out to me because as it happened, he'd read some of my fiction and thought maybe we could, he could help me or we could, we could um, help each other. And as I got to know him, uh, we then firmed up an idea to approach a publisher, Pam McMillan, with an idea for his book. And fortunately, it was accepted. And, uh, and so we worked together to produce Rhino War. Mr. John Starr was tasked with one of the country's biggest and most immediate challenge to combat the scourge of rhino poaching. So can you tell us more about his first real up close encounter with the wildlife? Yeah, definitely. So end of 2012, he was approached by South African National Parks. The then, the then managing executive, David Mabunda, uh, under orders from uh, former Environment Minister Edna Molewa to come in and, and change the way they did business. And his mission was to paramilitarise the South African National Park's Ranger Corps in the Kruger Park to better equip them and train them to take on what was a very resourceful, very organised adversary in the form of, of rhino poachers who were in the Kruger Park. And just to set the scene, while rhino poaching remains a, a big problem today, he would described it in Rhino War as a runaway train because it was in, by 2013. They were losing three rhinos a day, you know, plus or minus a thousand a year. And at any one time, there would be eight incidents within the park with possibly up to 12 different poaching gangs every, every single day and night of the year up against 400 rages. So you literally had several thousand people involved in poaching up against a force of 400 men and women on the ground. They were under-equipped. They were stressed at the time. They weren't trained. They were trained in the business of of conservation and looking after the felt and, and managing animals. And here they were in what was a, a very dangerous, risky situation up against armed people. General Use goes in there and he talks very frankly in the book Rhino War about how shocking it was from him. This was a man who had served in the military for 35 years in peace and war in the past. And he was now confronted as were the rangers, with the terrible slaughter that was going on uh, day after day of seeing these animals killed, um, seeing his men and women under his command uh, literally having to risk their lives to protect these animals. And he's come in as the experienced uh, general and has to have this commanding presence, but he's also assaulted by the sights and the st smells and the sounds of this, this carnage, you know, animals that have died in the bush orphan baby rhinos being left to their own devices. It was shocking for him. Mm. And he had to very quickly come up with a strategy to try and turn this runaway train around, or at least slow it down. And talking about his mandate to change the Kruka National Park into the paramilitary, so can you tell us more about the response he received from the rangers when he told them that now they have to go uh, paramilitary? Yeah, I think it was interesting to look at again at that time. They were doing a good job, but they were up against the most incredible odds. And, and I think one of the things that comes through in the book is that uh, I think perhaps 
in terms of the management of the park, the senior echelons, perhaps his appointment did cause a few waves. Uh, certainly we report in the book that uh, I think it's fair to say that, that perhaps the South African Police Service and perhaps the South African National Defence Force also thought they could be doing this job. And yet Sam Parks has taken this, as I said, rather controversial decision to bring in a guy who was almost retired at that stage from a different era. But it was about a process of change. And I think the rangers on the ground, and, and I interviewed some of them mm. in the course of helping General Hughes to write the book, I think they were grateful to have a fresh approach, a, a definitive strategy. And, and with his appointment, very quickly uh, came a number of significant changes because there are scenes in the book where we show that positive things had happened. You know, extra rangers had been recruited to the fight, yet the supply system hadn't kept up. They didn't have uniforms, they didn't have boots. There were rangers and their families living in tents when he first arrives. And so mm -hmm. his job is not only to start the process of training and equipping the rangers to take a, a paramilitary role and be able to at least be equal to the poachers. Mm -hmm. It's also very much a story about how he had to improve their welfare, to make sure they got their rations, their food, to make sure the rangers and their families had good housing, to make sure their equipment was up to stretch. And as we say in the book, part of the job also involved him having to take a very bold strategy, not just in combating poaching, but in travelling overseas, becoming uh, the public face of the fight and, and helping to, to garner funding. I mean, he was able to raise in the order of 400 million rand in external funding from international donors and other, and also um, some local uh, bodies in order to fund this very expensive fight. So I think the Rangers certainly welcomed the improvements because uh, that brought a doubling of the park's air wing with more helicopters, aircraft, uh, vehicles, uh, buckies, all-terrain vehicles, uh, things that the Rangers were lacking on the ground. So I think there were many positives that came through during this period. And what were the main measures he undertaken to reduce our uh, poaching and how many poachers did he apprehend? Yeah, the, um, the, the strategy that he came up with uh, was one of clearing the park from the outside. We, we, we talk often of the rangers and one thing that uh, General Euston and I wanted to ensure that in the book the rangers, the men and women of the South African National Parks Ranger Corps emerge as the heroes and the heroines of that book and I think that's something we succeeded by telling the story of the progress through their eyes. So what we did was, rather than say, talk about numbers of arrests, because it was an ongoing thing, it was happening mm. every day, we talk about some of the challenges he faced. And, and so this was about certainly improving the morale of the rangers on the ground. Clearing the park from the outside meant that he needed to also enlist the other arms of government, the other services, to start looking at a problem as a whole of society problem, not just within Kruger, because it was his view that you had to look outside of Kruger. He put a lot of time into forging strategic alliances across the border in Mozambique, mm -hmm. with some of the landholders over there, with the police, with the government in Mozambique, off his own bat, largely. And then to the west of Kruger, on the other side of the park, he had to forge alliances with the owners of private game reserves that border the Kruger Park. And these are all players that traditionally had not really been working or communicating much together. So there was a lot of high level strategic alliances. And that in fact changed the face of poaching. When he came into the park in 2013, about 75% of the rhino poaching was being conducted from Mozambique. But over the course of a couple of years, they turned that around. They were able to actually start securing that Mozambican side but then the poachers moved their efforts to the, the South African side. What we do show in the book is that while you can sometimes focus on the action and, and, and what's happening on the ground with rangers apprehending poachers, getting into gunfights with them, there is a huge volume of work behind the scenes. This is a book that features many strong women, uh, not just men, and uh, one of the greatest burdens fell to two women uh, from National Prosecuting Service who were then responsible for seeing these hundreds and hundreds of arrest dockets through the court system. And of course, going through the court system, that can take months, it can mm. take years. So there's this massive effort behind the scenes. It's not just about the number of people arrested, but the, the whole detail of having to investigate these incidents and then see them through to a successful prosecution. But he certainly was able to slow that runaway train and eventually turn it around so that the numbers did start to come down by about 2015.
And Mr. Park, can you tell us where in Kruger was poaching mostly taking place? The rhinos had been uh, traditionally congregated in the southern third of the Kruger National Park. Although, you know, it, it's a tribute to the success of South African national parks, funnily enough, that Kruger became such a target for, for poaching because the game reserves in KwaZulu-Natal had really been the 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 cradle of the of the re-establishment of the rhino. I mean, rhinos were almost extinct by the early part of the 20th century through hunting, uh, through the colonial era, and through land clearance and things like that. And the concerted effort in the 1950s brought their numbers back up. And then from KZN, those rhinos moved into Kruger, and were doing really, really well. It, it's something that I like to to point out is we we can focus on the problem, and we must focus on the problem. But we must realise that the reason the problem is serious in South Africa at the moment is because rhinos have been wiped out of most of their original home range on the African continent and throughout Southeast Asia where they also existed. So South Africa needs to be proud of the fact that it is the last bastion, along with Zimbabwe and Namibia, but really South Africa is the holder of the majority of the world's rhinos, is, is kind of a victim of its own success. So the, the, the numbers were concentrated in that sort of lower third or two thirds of the park. And part of his strategy was to really secure that southern part of Kruger to make sure that by the use of technology, through the use of increased training, increased resources from the ranges, that you can now really have a more manageable sized area. And it's known as an intensive protection zone. Uh, the situation he inherited was, if you like, there were so many rhinos that it was almost impossible to secure the whole of the Kruger Park, which has a boundary of a thousand kilometres. Mm. It's the size of a country, the size of Israel or Belgium. And you're trying to secure a country with 400 men and women who were poorly equipped and, and under-trained. The scale of the task he took on should not be underestimated, and nor should the results that the rangers were able to achieve. And, and I think the, the park is in, it's not fixed, the situation, mm -hmm. but it's in a, a stable, more uh, uh, a far more positive uh, position than it was back in 2012. So I'm not trying to talk down the problem, mm -hmm. but I think we must uh, acknowledge the success of the ranges over the years. And talk to us more about the number of risk ranges we're facing on a daily basis. Yeah, I mean, I like a lot of people in South Africa, I guess you, you, you're kind of aware of the problem, and you think you're aware of the problem when you look at uh, the numbers the numbers of, of rhinos killed. And yes, it is a serious uh, issue here now in, in 2022. But what we don't see is the far bigger picture of the number of incursions, the number of poachers that were present in the park at the time and the number that has stopped from getting through. I mean, through the use of technology, um, there, there are some, some fascinating uh, um, developments, South African homegrown developments, such as the use of radar to detect people mm -hmm. in the bush. And so in areas that are covered by some of these technological monitoring systems, they basically pick up nearly everybody that enters that area. It's almost impossible not to be detected. Of course, if you can catch the person is, a, is another thing. So the problem in effect, Tabi, I think is probably bigger than what most of us understand. Uh, and as I said, you had a situation back in 2012 where you had 400 men and women who were up against possibly between 2,500, 5,000 poachers across the course of a year coming and going, but they're on a, on a daily basis. And, and when a rhino is killed, it's, it's shocking and it's terrible, but what you don't see is the many more uh, gangs that don't get through, that, mm. that are stopped. And, and I think it, South Africa needs to be proud of the, the work that these men and women are doing, doing on the ground. Uh, I, I'm from Australia. I served in the Australian military. Militaries in other parts of the world, such as my country in America and the UK, they've been battling with this notion of women in combat roles for, for many years, should they or shouldn't be. I mean, the women in the South African National Parks Ranger Corps were involved in these risky, potentially deadly situations for many years and have been for many years. And then the country needs to be proud of the work that they've done. And lastly, Mr. Park, to whom do you recommend the book? I know sometimes people say, I don't read nonfiction or I only read fiction or I don't like <laughs> fiction. Uh, what we, what Johan and I set out to do with this book was to make it accessible. This could have been a textbook. Mm -hmm. It could have been an old general's memoirs about I did this and I did that. 
But no, we took the approach that we would write it almost as if I was writing one of my novels. Mm. So there's description of the Kruger Park. We try and put the reader in the shoes of the ranger as they're facing this inhospitable terrain, the risks of operating in big five country. There's action, there's intrigue, there's behind the scenes machinations. And as I said, there's a lot of strong female characters in the book. So I, I would recommend it to anyone with an interest in conservation. I would recommend it to business people who are looking for a very good example of change management. And I would also recommend it to young people because we talk about action, but it's not gratuitous. Um, and there's nothing in there that would offend a, a, a teenage reader. So if you're a, a young or an older person interested in conservation, perhaps if you're interested in, in strategy and change, it could be of interest to you. And if you're someone who wants to read about some inspiring uh, female characters as well as male characters, I can recommend this as a book. I like to say that it's, it's not a novel, but it could have been. <laughs> I, I couldn't have made up some of the mm. things that are in this book uh, because of the seriousness of the situation. Mm. But also, I think the positive message in the book. General Eustace's most common thing he says is it can be done with will, with good people, with support across jurisdictions and across borders, across the whole of society. You, you can make a change in, in whatever issue you're, you're facing. That was Tony Park speaking to Grima Media's Polity about Rhino Hall.